I'm um, Dr. Marie Tidball. I'm the coordinator of the Oxford University Disability Law and Policy Project. Um, for those who have just joined us, I just want to flag um, some access aspects at this stage. Um, Please use the Q&A box uh, in Zoom to send questions you might have for our panellists um, so that they can answer them during the Q&A portion of the discussion, which will begin around 5.30. Um, and uh, as this is a webinar session, audience members will automatically have your microphones and cameras off, but my colleague will be putting a note for those for access reasons who need to ask a question orally about how they can request to do so, in, and she'll put that in the, in the chat box. We have two British Sign Language interpreters um, interpreting for us today. Um, their names are Marie Oxen Hall and Claire Morgan, if you would like to pin their image to your screen. And finally, Finally, for a live transcription of this session um, that's being generated through Otter AI, please click on the Otter AI link in the chat. Okay, now that housekeeping um, or virtual housekeeping is done, we can um, go over to um, begin our panel uh, uh, discussion today. Um, and the panel will be chaired, I'm delighted to say, by Cameron Malik, um, CEO of Disability Rights uh, UK, who's, who's also our um, keynote chair. So Cameron has been CEO of Disability Rights UK since 2017. He has worked in the voluntary sector for over 20 years and for the last 15 years um, has run user-led organisations. He served on various boards of the third sector and was a member of Transport for London's independent disability advisory group, so particularly relevant for some of the discussion today. Cameron is listed in the Shore Trust 2018 Power 100 list of Britain's most influential disabled people and made it into the top 10 in their 2020 list. He was also runner-up in the Vodafone Diversity Campaigner Award 2017 and winner of the Celebrating Diversity Award from the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham in their inaugural Civic Honour oh, Honours Award in 2017 and finally Finally, he was recognised on Green Park's 2019 BAME 100 Business Leaders Index. We're delighted to have you with us, uh, and I'll hand it the, over to you, Cameron. Hi, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much, Marie, for that introduction. Delighted to be here, and uh, it's wonderful to see so many people joining us uh, today for what I hope is going to be a really interesting um, a series of presentations, followed by uh, hopefully some really interesting and thoughtful kind of questions at the end of it. Now, um, we've got an amazing panel of people who've joined us today, and um, uh, hopefully people have got access to everybody's um, full kind of biographies. Marie, will, will everyone who's, who's in the audience today have access to the biographies today? Yeah, we've got a website dedicated to this. They can go and access it on there. Fantastic. That's great, because I was th uh, saying earlier that if I start reading everyone's biographies we could spend all evening doing that because they've um they're, they're so extensive but um the people that you'll be hearing from today uh, are professor peter beresford who's a visiting yeah. professor at the university of east anglia and is the co-chair of the um, user-led organization called shaping our lives we've got dr De deborah fenny um, who's a senior researcher at the king's fund uh, dr sasha kosniech who's a lecturer at uh, Liverpool John Moores University, Jamoke Abdul Abdullai, who's the Communications and Media uh, Officer at Inclusion London, which is a disabled people's-led organisation. We're delighted that Jane Hatton's with us as well, who's the founder of um, Evenbreak, which is a, a recruitment agency led by disabled people for disabled people working with businesses who are um, positively looking to employ disabled people in their organizations. We've got Philip uh, Wilcox, who's the author and inspired uh, to write The Future of Autonomous, the US and China race to develop the driverless car after an accident in 2012 left him uh, legally blind. And uh, Dr. Kay in Inkle, who's a lecturer in health and social care at the uh, London Metropolitan University. So you're going to hear from those individuals very shortly, but I'm going to just kick off with a kind of an opening piece around um, the title of this, this, uh, this afternoon, this evening, which is, does the disability strategy do enough to address the twin crisis of climate change and life post COVID-19? So the 
I guess when I was thinking about this, I thought I could actually just give a very simple answer and say, no, it doesn't, and kind of end it there and then pass on to the next person. But I thought I should say a bit more than that. So yeah, the quick and simple answer is no. And they're kind of on both accounts, climate change or life post COVID-19 pandemic. It does not address the issue of uh, climate change, neither its disproportionate impact on disabled people, nor the role that we can play to shape our response as a community and as a nation. The strategy hasn't put disabled people at its heart because we were not involved. It isn't a strategy. What I see is, is a list of policy ideas that have been pulled together. Disabled people have been waiting a long time for a strategy that has met, that had kind of more than what this one included, more meat on its bones. And despite being 120 pages long, the strategy, or as I like to call it, a list, is disappointingly thin on um, immediate actions, medium term plans, and details of longer term investment. The strategy has insufficient concrete measures to address the current inequalities that we as disabled people experience in living standards and life chances. It does not address the structural inequalities that the pandemic has highlighted. There are scant plans and timelines, uh, timescales on how to bring about vastly needed and improved uh, benefit system, housing, social care, jobs, education, transport, and equitable access to a wider society. Disabled people aren't part of the climate emergency conversation as was proved this week. We can't even get in the room where the conversation is taking place. As was highlighted by the Israeli minister who was a wheelchair user, who was prevented from attending COP26 this week because the entrance was not wheelchair accessible. She tweeted that it was sad that the UN does not provide accessibility to its events. And UK Secretary of State for Environment, George Eustace, implied it was Israel's fault for not informing the organizers um, of her access needs during uh, or before turning up at the wrong entrance, which is both offensive and misses the point. The minister was denied entry, denied the mic and denied a seat at the table. A UN report on the environment and disabled people stated that the inclusion of disabled people in climate planning is essential, not just to ensure the safety of disabled people, but the success of measures to avert a climate disaster. A disability inclusive human rights based approach to climate change entails climate action that is inclusive of and accountable to disabled people at all stages. Effective climate change action relies on approaches by the whole of society in order to be successful. Poor access has become the background noise of our lives. We need to turn up the volume, turn it up enough so that non-disabled people can hear it, not just when it happens to a disabled minister or Paralympian, but every time it happens. In fact, we have to stop talking about poor access and tell the truth about being denied access. No one dares put up a sign that says no disabled people over the door, but that is what they mean when they say, oh no, how awful. We want this to be an inclusive event for everyone. We just can't be bothered to make it happen. The disability strategy does not address disabled people and the climate crisis at all, nor does it invite disabled people and, and our organizations to share our lived experience and discuss solutions together. When we are excluded from the conversation, public policy and decision making suffer. Whether it is because the government does not value consultation or because entry to a building is not access that entry to a building is not accessible, the result is the same. Disability discrimination is amplified. If, dif if disabled people are not at the table when the climate crisis is discussed, many of us will die. If disabled people are not engaged in the changes that need to happen in our country, then those changes will fail. Include us, you need us. So with that, I'm going to um, introduce our next speaker, which is um, Dr. Uh, Professor Beresford. Professor Beresford, I'm going to hand over to you and I wonder what um, your thoughts are on the vision in the National Disability Strategy. Do you think it meets the challenges that we as disabled people face now? Thanks very much for that. Uh, it's good to be here. We're seeking to address big and I think related questions here about climate change and pandemics. And to answer what you said, this discussion starting from the National Disability Strategy 
is I think, friend, a bit like the answer the lost traveller got when they asked a stranger for direction. If I wanted to get to where you want to go, then I wouldn't start from here. Let's explain. Let's look a little bit more closely at the National Disability Strategy beyond what we've already heard, not just as it's been presented by government, but received by disabled people and reported by the respected Disability News Service. Prime Minister Johnson said in August that the strategy would be a down payment on the promise to build back better and fairer for all our disabled people. But analysis of the strategy by the Disability News Service shows it was accompanied by £3.95 million in new funding, maybe enough to give a refit to one of the lifeboats of the yachts moored near Glasgow, or just 28p for every disabled person in the UK. All the rest was old money re-announced. And when challenged about this lack of new funding by the Commons Work and Pensions Committee, the then Minister for Disabled People, Justin Tomlinson, later stacked and replaced by Chloe Smith, suggested that new funding was likely to be announced soon. He told the committee that a huge amount of the work of the dis government's disability unit in the following few weeks would be to provide evidence for individual government departments that would strengthen the likelihood of disability focused funding bids being successful in the funding a spending review, which sets departmental budgets up to 24 5. Despite this pledge, budget and spending review documents published last week by the Treasury appear to include no details of any such funding being agreed by the Chancellor other than for education and the DWP. All the rhetorics there in the 100 plus page strategy. It talks about the problems for disabled people, the effects of COVID, the importance of lived experience, so it can't be excused on grounds of ignorance. But there's still no clear program for change beyond exhortation, promises and annual reports, and of course, still no cash. I couldn't find any mention of climate change or specific proposals to ensure that disabled people aren't again the main victims of another pandemic. So I wouldn't start from there either. The strategy not so much fails as doesn't address the questions we've been asked to consider today, nor would I start from the other substantive disability strategy this government and its predecessors seem to have, judging by its day-to-day -day policy, to oppress and victimise disabled people with cruel and arbitrary welfare reform policy, to cut social care support, and make it increasingly inadequate. With government-funded researchers linking post-2010 cuts to spending on social care and health by the Conservative-led coalition to more than 57,000 deaths in England in just four years. And then to have almost nothing to say about how it's going to improve things for working age disabled people in its proposals for social care reform, focusing only on older disabled people whose vote it, votes it wants. And finally, to ignore the views of disabled people in all our diversity as people with physical, sensory and intellectual impairments, long-term conditions, as mental health service users like myself, as people who identify as diverse in terms of gender, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, belief in taking forward its policy and provisions. Thus, most recently last month, the government invited sector leaders to a summit on health and social care without including any disabled people's organization and with not one disabled person representative present. If we want to make progress in relation to both COVID and future pandemics and climate change, then I'd say there are at least three essential evidence steps to take. One, learn from the independent living strategy set up by New Labour but sadly cut short which brought together different government departments to have coordinated and holistic focus, involved disabled people themselves centrally, and was committed to developing a network of disabled people's own organizations. Two, extend support and explicit provisions and requirements for that inclusive involvement of disabled people and our own organizations in the development of policy and practice, building the potential of genuine co-production, for example, Disabled people had much valuable experience to contribute from their own day-to-day -day experience of isolation, lockdown, and inaccessible transport, but minimal effort's been made to learn from this expertise and lived experience under COVID. Social work education is well evidenced as an exemplar of how helpful, helpful and workable involving such lived experience is, with such involvement operating a mandatory at every stage and in every aspect of such learning and qualification and received central, has received central government funding support to make it possible. Three, 
The philosophy of independent living based on the social model of disability developed by disabled people must be the principle underpinning future disability policy in practice. It's embodied in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, to which the UK are signatories, and the UNCRPD should be the centerpiece of any new disability strategy. The idea of progressive realization developed in the UNCRPD should also be adopted with the unmet need of disabled people at last being recorded in social care and beyond to identify the resources that will be needed and to make possible their gradual allocation. Going back to the question of asking, of, uh, asked of us, I see no conflicts between the rights of disabled people and the sustainability of our planet, the opposite. So it was great to see that the Scottish Disabled People's Organization, Inclusion Scotland, had helped to secure an event focused on disabled people and climate change for the first time in the 30 year history of the UN Climate Change Treaty yesterday. Like other disadvantaged groups and groups facing discrimination, we as disabled people bear the brunt of public policy and politics that increasingly divide and damage both individuals and communities, nations and states. The disabled people's movement internationally has pioneered accessible approaches to ensuring real and inclusive change and democracy that challenges marginalization in relation to protected characteristics and other discriminations and oppressions. We've been knocking hard on political doors and policy doors for years. Strategies for the future will be those that bring everyone together in our different struggles nationally and globally, giving us strength and reinforcing commitments to humane and sustainable ways of living, connecting and working together. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much for that. And I think um, your, how you outlined those three steps, I thought were incredibly powerful and really speak to the, the slogan that we have, nothing about us without us. So thank you very much for taking us through that. Um, next on the agenda, we did have Dr. Deborah Fenney, but I understand she uh, wasn't able to join us today because um, she wasn't very well. So we're going to go on to ask Dr. Um, Sasha Kozniach to uh, join us next and tell a talk from her perspective really about understanding the relationship between multiple inequalities in order to inco uh, incorporate this into policies and achieve the agenda 2030. Um, Dr. Sasha Kozniach. Uh, hello everyone, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I will share a short presentation. So now I'll share my screen. I hope you can see it now. Yeah, yes, everyone we can, can see, see it. it. Yes, we can. Brilliant. Thank you. So uh, I will uh, try to give a short presentation on tensions between disability rights and climate environmental policy as I'm climate change researcher looking at biodiversity change and impacts on vulnerable population, indigenous, but also disabled populations. So at the background, you have a photo of terrestrial in aquatic ecosystems. And this is very important to understand that we have this twin crisis so we have climate change crisis that is impacting global temperatures increase, melting ice caps, but also causing unprecedented biodiversity loss. The good news is that the Human Rights Council recognized the human right to clean, healthy and sustainable environment. So this is a human right for all, including disabled population. But what is the problem? Why there is no disabled populations, including into the policy? Uh, during uh, our research uh, on Madagascar, we understood that there is very little done on climate change impact on disabled population in terms of research. There is a huge gap. So we published a letter in science showing that IPBS and IPCC reports do not take into account disabled populations and at all and the impact of climate change on disabled population. Uh, 
Uh, as you might all know, climate change is very spatially and temporally variable. So it's going to be different around the globe. And the diff there, will, there will also be a different impact on disabled population. It will be impact throughout extreme events, but also non-extreme events. So extreme events are hurricanes, cyclones, floods, heat, heat waves, cold waves, even cold waves, yes. And then we have a long-term onset events such as sea level rise, biodiversity loss, or evasive species. And we need to understand how each of those events are going to impact disabled population in order to implement this into the policy. So how we can do this? We can do this through environmental justice framework. First, we need to understand how the climate and environmental change impact disabled population through distributional dimension of environmental justice. Then, are people with disabilities recognized in the research and policy of climate change and environmental change, recognitional dimension? And the last, to what extent are disabled population included in decision and policy making regarding climate environmental change, procedural dimension? And this is the, 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 the worst at the, at the moment, there, there is almost no procedural dimension for disabled population. Uh, we did a systematic review showing what is the research that is out there. And as you can see, it's very scarce. There is huge gap. For example, Latin America doesn't have any research on climate change impact on disabled population. Canada, Canada none. China also. So there is a huge gap in terms of understanding how climate and environmental change, loss of biodiversity, impact disabled population, but not only disabled population, we need to take into account intersectionality so you can have indigenous populations with disabilities and they will have even higher impact on of climate change and environmental change. But we have the tool, we have sustainable development goals and we cannot reach uh, sustainability without equality. So in order, in order to uh, make progress on SDGs, in particular SDGs 13, 14, and 15, we need to actively include disabled populations. And I'm thinking about uh, reducing inequalities, SDGs 10, uh, gender equality, SDG 5, Equality, equality and equal education, SDG 4, and SDG 1, no poverty. That will be all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Sasha. Thank you for that. Okay, so we are what, right on time, which is great. Um, Sorry, I'm just calling up my other screen, which is the thing about virtual. Everything's on your laptop. <laughs> um, so we're going to move on to um, hear from uh, a couple of different, a few different people. So the climate crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic requires us to live and work differently. And how can we use these challenges to design more inclusive cities, employment, transport, housing, infrastructure? So I'm going to um, ask Jane to come in and tell us and talk to us a little bit about your thoughts on um, employment and disabled people and how um, what we've learned really through the pandemic. Jane. Hi, thanks, Cameron. And hi, everyone. Very, very pleased to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we know that disabled people are disproportionately impacted by um, both climate change in terms of not being um, brought to the table, as we've heard people say already, and the fact that we will be the most impacted um, by climate change. And also the pandemic that we've just been through, again, as ever, disabled people are disproportionately impacted. So 60% of the people who died of COVID were disabled people, um, but also there were issues around carers, around care support, not being um, accessed by people, um, 
and by employment. So disabled people were more likely to be made redundant or furloughed or lose their jobs altogether. I think the pandemic did, there are some silver linings. I mean, it was horrific, obviously, in many, many ways, but I think some things came out of it in terms of employment and um, certainly inequality was very starkly exposed during the pandemic. You know, we had the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we were able to see that the different kinds of impact that COVID had on different parts of the community. We also discovered, no surprise to disabled people at all, that remote working was a thing. It was a thing that could work. It didn't have to be a reasonable adjustment for disabled employees. We actually discovered that people working from home are just as effective, if not more so, than people who are working um, in the office. And something else that's perhaps a bad thing that came out of the pandemic, and maybe also with um, Brexit in the UK, is um, huge, huge skill shortages. But actually that does give an opportunity for disabled people because while there are skill shortages, employers are gonna have to look to new markets, to new pools of talent that maybe they've not looked at previously. And obviously disabled people form part of that pool of talent. My own view, I'm a disabled social entrepreneur. I run um, a, a social enterprise that is populated entirely by disabled people, and we exist to help disabled people find work. And we have always known that disabled people form premium candidates. We're often seen as pity hires by employers. <laughs> oh, poor things, poor disabled people. We really should give them a chance. Um, we have to constantly push back on that narrative and say this isn't about pity, it isn't about charity, this is about talent. And actually disabled people aren't um, just other candidates that bring talent, we bring additional talent and skills with us and we always have done. So the whole social, and model, social model of disability tells us that as disabled people we face barriers all the time that other people don't face. And what that means is that we have to develop skills around things like um, creative problem solving, project managing. You know, if we're going somewhere, we have to plan it like a military exercise. Are the stations going to be um, accessible to us? What happens if I go to my normal tube station and the lift isn't working? I'm going to have to find out another way to get to the destination I'm going to. And when I get there, is it going to be accessible? So we have to plan ahead. We have to do contingency planning. We have to be creative. We have to be resilient. And all of those skills actually make us premium candidates when we're looking at the workplace. Which employer wouldn't want people who are not going to run away at the first sign of a problem, but look at different ways of, of managing and, and finding solutions to that problem. So we always were premium candidates. I would say now, post pandemic, I know we're not quite post pandemic yet, but hopefully we will be before too long. This is even more true than ever, because what we now understand from the pandemic is that there are, in fact, lots of different ways of working that are all effective. We don't have to be full time, 40 hours a week, nine to five, Monday to Friday in the office. That isn't the only model that works in the workplace. So employees can work part time. They can work at night. They can work at weekends if it suits them to do so. They might have childcare responsibilities during the, during the week. It might be that people want to work from home or want to work remotely and will be using technology. And when I've just, all of that that I've just talked about is nothing to do with disability. That's about people. And a lot of people in the pandemic have said, actually, I much prefer working from home. I really prefer not to have that two hour commute every day that's chugging all sorts of stuff into the atmosphere that's affecting climate change. I'm actually preferring to work from home. Conversely, there are some disabled people who said, no, actually, I can't wait to get back to the office because I like the company of people around me. So I think what we've learned from that is that the way of work has changed and will stay changed now because you can't put the genie back in the bottle. People who have now discovered that you can work from home effectively won't any longer put up with being told, no, it's not possible because we know it is possible, we've proved it's possible. But what we're looking at now are new ways of working. So it may be remote working, it may be people working different numbers of hours in different locations. It will definitely mean using different kinds of technology. So who are the best people to work in that new kind of ways of working? 
Well, in my view, it's disabled people because we have always been doing things differently. We have to do things differently to get through the day, to find our way around the barriers that we, that we face in front of us. So actually the new way of working where we're working more flexibly, we're working in different ways, we're, we're embracing different technology. Actually, disabled people need to be leading on that because we're the experts. It's something we've done all along. It's something we've been asking for all along. It's something we do every day of our lives. So we're no longer just premium candidates. Candidates, We're absolutely essential in the workplace. I think it's really important for us to get employers on board and understand that this is nothing to do with pity and everything to do with what they can gain. And I think even now, early on in the new way of working, those organisations who haven't taken on board the new way of working, they've said, no, you've all got to go back to the office and start commuting again, are going to be left behind very, very quickly because nobody will want to work for them, not just disabled people. They will be unpopular employers. They'll lose the war for talent, you know, whether we're disabled or, or non-disabled. So I think just a quick note on the uh, on the government's response to all of this, um, and and like Cameron, you know, my, my answer to the question is: Does the disability strategy go far enough? Is well, no, no, it doesn't. Um, but I think that the government really need to uh, accept this new way of working. And to be fair, and I like to try and be fair, there are some things that the government does which is based on completely the wrong starting point, the wrong premise. So for example, work capability assessments are based on the, on the premise that disabled people really don't want to work. So they're gonna pretend they're disabled so that they can get benefits. I'm not saying there are no disabled people like that. I haven't met any. The disabled people I know really want to work if they're able to work. And if they don't want, can't work for whatever reason, desperately need support. So the work capability assessments and even worse sanctions we're going to starve you into working is uh, it's never going to work because we're tackling the wrong problem. The problem isn't disabled people. The problem is the barriers that disabled people face when they're looking for work. But some of the things that the government does, to be fair to them, are based on the right premise. So I think disability confident is based on the fact that actually it's employers that need to change. It's employers that need to remove the disabling barriers that are preventing a lot of disabled people from participating in the workplace. So the premise behind disability confident, which is employers need to do better, is great. But the implementation is, is pretty poor. It's very bureaucratic. It takes a long time. Um, I mean, we're still in the you know, 18th century where you can't claim online. You still have to send everything in. You know, I mean, it's very bureaucratic and old fashioned. Um, and the other um, government initiative that I, I love is access to work because that's based on the right premise too. That's based on the premise that sometimes disabled people need support in removing those barriers that are in front of them. And employers shouldn't necessarily have to bear the cost of that. So because it can put them off employing disabled people. So there is something there that, you know, people can um, uh, claim. And so access to work is great. But again, you know, the implementation isn't great. So the government could do a great deal more to support the whole reducing the employment gap, which we know the disability employment gap has been around 30%. And if you look deep enough at the figures, consistently 30% for, for decades now and hasn't been changing with anything the government has been doing. And I think it's because my perception of, of the government's priorities is that disability still comes way down the agenda. So we've had the gender pay gap. And boy, didn't that make a difference. I mean, that year when I was talking to employers about disability, we can't, we haven't got time for that. We're doing the gender pay gap. Everybody was focused on the gender pay gap. Great, I'm a woman. I'm very happy for people to focus on that. But actually, it's all about intersectionality. You know, women can be of color. They can be disabled. They can be gay. You know, we can't, we're people shaped. We're not box shaped. So Jane, yes, we're almost out of time. Yeah, no, that's fine. So finally, I just wanted to say that I think it's important that, dis that uh, the government put disability firmly on the agenda, both in climate change and in em employment, and we need to be there at the table. Brilliant. Thank you, Jane. And I, I love the uh, uh, that disabled people are good at um, project management. You described it as military grade project management skills. <laughs> I'm going to put that on my CV. That sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you very much. And you also talked about digital. And so I'm going to introduce now Philip Wilcox, who I mentioned earlier, 
um, was inspired to write the future in, is autonomous, the US and China race to develop the driverless car. Peter, <laughs> welcome. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your work and your thinking around autonomous vehicles for disabled people and the benefits of that technology for the development of accessible green vehicles. So thank you very much, Cameron. Thank you very much also to uh, Dr. Um, Mary Tidball and the Oxford University Law and uh, Disability Law and Policy uh, Project. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but uh, thank you very much. And uh, to all my panelists, thank you as well for your incredible uh, your work as well. So back in uh, 2012, while I was studying for my MA in international relations, I uh, suffered uh, near fatal injuries as well as a result of an accident. And one of those injuries left me uh, legally blind. Uh, so because I cannot drive a car anymore or any sort of vehicle, that really sort of brought home to me just how <laughs> vital transportation is for pretty much everything, for educational opportunities, for work, for uh, social engagements, even for to get food from a grocery store, all of that thing, all that stuff would need some sort of transportation to get the, to get that uh, necessary. And just also how to serve uh, lack of accessibility and affordability for transport options to get to a place uh, efficiently. So you always have to wait for a long time or you need to pay money to get an Uber or something to go somewhere else. And so that's where I really started paying attention to the development of the self-driving car or the autonomous vehicle, which I would just uh, henceforth call the AV, because I believe that this has the potential to make great gains in both uh, access and um, opportunities for disabled people, and also to limit the effects of uh, climate change as well. So tackle the, the twin crises that we're, we've been talking about so far in, in this, this panel. So I guess before we get started, I guess we need to decide what exactly are these vehicles, give you a little bit of a, a background. Uh, my, my background is in uh, policy, so it is not in engineering or computer science, uh, but I, I can do a very basic uh, explanation of th these vehicles. Um, these vehicles have uh, a lot of cameras and other radar and other sensors that will help uh, basically perceive the world around the vehicle while it's driving. It also has things like a GPS and uh, a wheel sensors as well to see how fast the vehicle is going and where it is. So the car knows where it is in the world and wherever else is going on around it. Uh, and from that point, you can um, you can, you can then say uh, that, that all that information, all that data for the sensory and all the information gets sent to a, a central computer within the car. And in that central computer, you have programmed in already the sense of like a, a path planning. So whenever you get all information and the uh, vehicle knows what's around it, they can then form a path to decide, okay, what can I do to avoid any sort of uh, obstacle to avoid an accident. And from that point, it gets sent to the actual operating system where, you know, the, the steering wheel, the brakes, the, you know, the, the acceleration, all of that to decide what can we do to avoid the accident. Well, I'm talking about these in separate stages. All of these things are technically happening at the same time or as fast as possible to as you're, while you're driving down the road, you need to be, uh, make sure that everything is, is getting done very fast to make sure that you're avoiding any sort of accident. Um, so first of all, I want to uh, begin to speak about sort of uh, the, the climate crisis, given that we are in uh, COP26 right now. And so it's a very timely thing to be talking about. And uh, vehicle emissions are a huge part of that, of that, of that problem because both in the UK and in the US. Um, just recently, I, I read a statistic where based on 2019 uh, uh, statistics, uh, there was 27% of the overall uh, emissions produced by the UK were due to climate exhaust or to do engine exhaust. So that is a huge part of, of the, the problem. And um, 
you know, from the very beginning of the testing and uh, development of these uh, autonomous vehicles, they were hybrid vehicles because it would make sense when you have you know the computer trying to manage your your vehicle to say all the things would have to be electric all of the the gear shift the steering the acceleration all that would have to be electric to communicate effectively with the computer so all of that would have to be electric and um given that a lot of the companies say that their initial use case will be to serve as like a mobility as a service, like an Uber. And what's happening right now is you have Waymo in the US and Arizona that they're running completely driverless taxi service uh, within, within that area. It's within a certain small area, but it's a completely driverless taxi service. And they've been doing that for a year now or over a year. It's recently had their year anniversary um, so that is uh, something that's already going on right now and could be uh, potentially also included in the UK as well. And it's something that ideally would mean fewer cars on the road when you'd have uh, more people using the same. But then again, um, the elite went to the session of whether those vehicles would be accessible or not. And that would lead you to uh, some problems related for the disability community. Um, and also related to things that it's within this company's interest if their first use case will be as like an Uber service to make your, your vehicles electric. Uh, to make it, if your vehicles are EVs, then they have a, a, a much, they last for longer uh, on, for the most, for the most part, and there's uh, less wear and tear than uh, from from just the, the industry or from the engineering standpoint. So they can they can last longer and they would obviously produce much much fewer emissions. Excuse me. And yeah, from, from that standpoint, you could see that there could be a potential for huge uh, climate, um, climate climate reduction. Like I say, how would this fit into the current city? Well, the, the technology itself uh, can be modified to fit any sort of any sort of vehicle that you're talking about. You know, and then in the U.S., we have things like uh, delivery robots, dropping in enclosed spaces. You obviously can't drive them on the road, down the highway, or anything like that. But for things like a university campus or something like a, a hospital setting. You could have uh, the, the robots that could deliver, you know, food or medical supplies to uh, doctors and other other people within that within that enclosed space. So something that could be used uh, to be automated or have teleoperations as well, and also uh, drones as well for delivery. I know uh, in the UK you have something that's called C uh, CCAV a center for connected and autonomous vehicles. And they have uh, many different uh, pilot projects happening around the UK. One of which was a deliver, uh, delivery to the Isle of Man using drones. So it'd be something that would uh, deliver needed supplies to a community where there might be a, a low volume, low number of people that want those supplies and a high cost. So something Philip. that could be Philip, you know, you've got about a minute. Oh, okay. okay. So it could be something that would be simpler to deliver and things like that. And you also have the first mile, last mile. So something that could be a, a even a like a shuttle service that could be accessible for wheelchairs and for uh, other accessibility options that could take people from a metro or to a metro to a local uh, shopping center or. Uh, housing complex. So it could be for the, for both a uh, for with transportation and for food and goods delivery as well. In the US we have Neuro, which is delivering both Domino's pizza and groceries in Texas and other parts of California and things like that. So I think that there's a lot of potential, but I would say that just to close off of inclusion, that there's still a lot of policy and um, and and also legal issues that we need to be worked out related to AVs. And also the, uh, the 
the public trust. So it's a new technology. It takes a lot to to get the trust and see maybe if we can some of these things in the Q and A. You can contact me afterwards or have been a shameless self promotion. You <laughs> could uh, read my book and <laughs> see if there's any more information you could find out as well. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Philip, thank you very much. That's really interesting. Um, fascinating to hear about what, what uh, autonomous vehicles are doing and particularly the trials and um, really the kind of the benefits going to offer so many people, not, not just disabled people, but particularly disabled people, blind, visually impaired, and of course, people with other health conditions that prevent them from driving everyday vehicles. Thank you very much for that. And so I'm going to move over to introduce Dr. Kay um, Inkor, who's the uh, campaigns and policy manager at Wheels for Wellbeing. Kay, welcome. Um, you're going to tell us about another form of transport, but this one's kind of self-powered. That's right. Thank you. And I'm just going to share my screen, please, if that's possible. I have a yep. presentation. OK. Uh, OK, hopefully you yep, can, we can see, see that. that. We can see it. And it's on slideshow. Lovely. So thank you very much for inviting me along. Um, it's great to be here and to uh, get to hear everybody else that's speaking as well. So as Cameron said, my name is Kay Inkle and I'm the Campaigns and Policy Manager at Wheels for Wellbeing. We are a disabled people's organisation who provide access to cycling at three off-road centres in London where people can go and try a whole range of different non-standard cycles in a disability positive environment. And nationwide, we also campaign for accessibility in cycling and active travel from government policy through local organisations and local government. So obviously cycling is really important in terms of sustainability and it's something that we've heard a lot of on that ground uh, recently. But why is cycling important for disabled people? So disabled people face huge inequalities in terms of transport and mobility. So-called public transport in the UK is really only for a quite a privileged minority of the public, depending on where you live and what your demographic status is. So only around 50% of train stations in many regions have access and using the train if you're a disabled person comes with a whole set of barriers, including to having to ring up and book in advance, having to hope assistance such as a ramp or a guide or show up having to hope that the spot that you've booked for your wheelchair or your mobility aid hasn't been taken by baggage, having to hope that the toilet isn't broken and so on and so on. <laughs> like, likewise, pub, so-called public transport often only allows one disabled person to travel at a time and only has a very limited range of mobility equipment. So some wheelchairs and mobility scooters that are allowed on board. So moving around can be made hugely difficult for disabled people. So that's one of the difficulties that they, disabled people face. One of the others is there's huge health inequalities. Disabled people face have the worst mental and physical health outcomes of any group in the UK. And this is often assumed to be a direct correlation between being disabled makes you ill but actually so much of that is the secondary implications of the enforced sedentary lifestyles that disabled people face because of difficulties in accessing transport, health, exercise and other facilities and the kinds of discrimination that go along with that. So a lot of those health inequalities are structural. And that's also true when we look at the fact that has already been mentioned, 60% of the COVID deaths in England were disabled people. And again, rather than just assuming that that is already due to a health vulnerability, again, so much of that is structural, the secondary health complications that we know make people vulnerable to COVID, and also the fact of living in care facilities, which were desperately unprotected during the pandemic. 
So of course, if you have difficulty moving around and you have poor health, you are going to face obviously social exclusion, and that's exacerbated by the lack of access to culture, recreation, leisure, and social spaces, which again exacerbate those health inequalities. And on top of that, disabled people face a huge amount of economic inequalities. So again, we've already heard about the disability employment and pay gaps. And um, there's also education gaps. And we know that disabled people are more likely in the UK to face poverty and material deprivation. And again, the links between poverty and ill health are widely known. So for us then, cycling is a multifaceted solution to all of these barrier imposed problems. So it's a form of transport and mobility. It's a form of access to physical and mental health. It's a way of participating in social, leisure, recreation activities, and also potentially increases people's economic opportunities through independent transport and so on. However, there are huge barriers for disabled people who want to cycle. So a lot of this is infrastructural. So if you use a non-standard cycle, then many cycle paths are stepped. They're too narrow for you to travel on. There is lots of cycle parking structure that doesn't work either for a non-standard cycle or for a disabled person using a bicycle because you're expected to be able to get off your bicycle, lift it over your head into a two-tier rack. Lots of issues like roads, quality of road surface, the fact that cycleways often just stop randomly and people are expected to be able to get off and push their cycle also exclude disabled people. But more than that, non-standard cycles are hugely expensive. So if you need something like a hand cycle, a recumbent or an e-assist tricycle, you're looking at the price of a second-hand car around £5,000. And that's in the condition where we already know there's a massive employment and pay gap. Other disabled people who rely on benefits often fear losing those benefits if they're seen to be too active because the benefit system is very punitive in terms of the way that it measures people's capacities. There's also a lack of share and hire schemes for disabled people, which again, although they're there for non-disabled people, really it's disabled people who are going to struggle to access through the cost of cycles and also issues around having space for storage of non-standard cycles. And again, the benefit system, the, be the bedroom tax, which puts a penalty on people's benefits if they have a spare room, even if that's used to store medical or mobility equipment, again, creates a barrier for disabled people accessing cycling. So what, we might ask, has the National Disability Strategy done to address any of this? Well, the answer is straightforwardly, absolutely nothing. It doesn't address any of these barriers. And in fact, the National Disability Strategy doesn't mention active travel at all. Um, there are a few very general aspirations about improving the accessibility of public transport, for example, train stations, um, but there is no clarity around that. So no dates, budgets or plans are given for when we can even expect public transport to be accessible. And again, this sits in an interesting contrast with the current Department of Transport work, which is actually being very active in promoting accessibility in active travel. So there are a couple of documents, Gear Change and LTN 120, which are really adamant in promoting all active travel infrastructure must be accessible to disabled people. And yet this is not acknowledged at all in the National Disability Strategy. And again, this also contrasts with the Department for Work and Pensions. And um, so, so we know that the Department for Work and Pensions and Benefits creates a huge barrier to active travel in many ways. Um, but within the disability strategy, there is nothing about how that is going to be improved. There's, there's some suggestions around improving communications about benefits or assessments, but nothing about a material increase which will improve disabled people's quality of lives and allow access to, to active travel. And certainly nothing about this kind of systemic changes that are needed to move away from a punitive benefit system that still seems to operate on the idea that if you make dis being disabled hellish enough, disabled people will somehow choose to not be disabled and just go and be non-disabled and have a life like everybody else. 
Unfortunately, you can't punish people out of being disabled. So in short, the disability strategy offers nothing uh, in terms of active travel for disabled people, and nor does it offer anything in terms of ironing out the contradictions between different government departments that have so much sway over the lives of disabled people and the quality of lives that we live and our own goals in terms of being healthy and active and living sustainably. Thank you. And just to say, I have a few resources that I might drop into the uh, chat if anybody wants to follow up on any of those. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. That'd be great. Please do um, copy and paste them into the okay. chat, as you said, that'd be great. Thank you very much. I'm going to go um, move on now to um, our next speaker and kind of coming back to a number of things that have been mentioned really about the impact of the pandemic um, and the numbers of disabled people who've been impacted by the pandemic and the numbers of deaths. Another aspect that's really completely often forgotten and not talked about is the intersectionality aspect of, um, of our lives. And so I'm delighted to introduce uh, Jamoke Ab Abdullahi, who's the Communication and Media Officer at Inclusion London. Hi, I wonder if you'd like to um, welcome, and uh, I'm going to hand over to you to talk to us about kind of the intersectionality side. Great, thank you so much, Cameron, uh, and thank you so much. Um, I will first of all just quickly say the issue with going last is that most of the people have already mentioned the things that they want to say, so I might just kind of like freewheel it at this point. Um, so. For me, my name is Jamoke Abdullahi, and I'm a disabled uh, black woman. So what this means within um, a UK context is that I'm actually um, triply marginalized through my gender, through my race, and also through disability. So earlier in the summer, uh, journalist John Pring uh, reported that most of the 1.6 billion pound investment mentioned in the national disability strategy had already been announced or allocated before the strategy was even published. And the strategy was padded out with promises to do more research and consider further action. But it's difficult to hold in high regard the promises of a government that so routinely lets disabled people down, including those that don't usually live in the UK. As previously mentioned, um, a recent highlight, uh, headline of the disabled Israeli minister that wasn't able to attend COP26 because of a lack of wheelchair access is disturbingly indicative of the government's lack of consideration or thought for disabled people. The twin crises of climate change and life during a global pandemic has shown how often disabled people are so close to the point of harm. It was widely reported that six of every 10 persons or 60% that lost their lives due to COVID-19 were actually disabled with those with learning disabilities being impacted at a much higher rate. The national disability strategy is no strategy at all. The NDS was developed with was not developed with disabled people or our organizations. Due to this lack of proper consultation, it doesn't address key problems that disabled people have, nor does it reflect the issues and priorities of disabled people. So, <clears throat> excuse me, both the global pandemic and climate change have illustrated that the needs of disabled people are often not thought of until it's actually too late. So, Speaking of intersectionality, the NDS itself is not good enough for anyone, let alone those that are multiply marginalized due to their race, gender, sexuality, or any other protected characteristics. The strategy does not look at socioeconomic barriers and material disadvantages um, that are present in people's lives. This, featured, uh, this didn't feature at all in the National Disability Strategy. So, being a disabled black woman in the UK, I'm unfortunately being dealt the issues of ableism, racism, and sexism. And it's an issue that the Disab National Disability Strategy doesn't actually look at the issues and problems that disabled people face with an intersectional lens. It is not one day that I'll have to deal with racism and then on a different day, I might have to consider sexism and then 
on the third day, I'll have to consider ableism. I'm experiencing all three, all at once, all at the same time to varying degrees. And it's absolutely imperative that the government actually considers that when looking not only at the disability strategy, but just policies generally, because the UK is not just made up of white, non-disabled men, right? So the issue that um, black and non-black um, people of color face is the fact that you're having to be put into these situations where you are uh, put in close point of harm. Such an example being Beli Mujenga, rest her soul, who was a um, black woman that had a position that meant that she had to be public facing, even though she had spoken with her employers that it wasn't safe for her to do so owing to uh, underlying health conditions and unfortunately lost her life. It is because of those um, reasons, because people's races, um, because of people's race that they have to be in certain positions where they're in poorer housing, they don't have access to the same things that um, other people do and they aren't able to get the medical attention either at all or as quickly as their non uh, as their white counterparts. And this often puts people in the in the way of harm and in the way of uh, danger. And the fact that this wasn't considered within the disability strategy is disappointing, but not surprising. As previously mentioned by all the people that have spoken before me, it is unfortunately quite par for the course for this particular government that we've had for over a decade. So there have been um, statistics. So there was a Stay Safe East blog that said that the disability strategy does not um, address the specific needs of women. And you know, stats often show us that black people are overrepresented in forced treatment, such as with regards to mental health. And also when it comes to being in contact with police, Nothing, including people's lives, exists in a vacuum. Having no access to good accessible housing or access to medical treatment and living in homes that are in a state of disrepair, it's very difficult to actually challenge and even hope to change people's current situations because they are trapped both literally within their homes and systematically within a system that it's difficult to even try to consider you know, policy changes or trying to affect those changes that would actually better their lives because they're trying to figure out how are they going to heat their homes? How are they going to put food on the table and clothes on their backs? The, <clears throat> excuse me, what makes it even more difficult is that a lot of the policies that the government uses, it doesn't um, consider the needs of those that are um, multiply marginalized, those that might be might have more than one protected characteristic. So it's like, these are the stats for black people. These are the stats for disabled people, but it doesn't look at, for example, the stats um, that exist for disabled black people. In which ways do racism and ableism reinforce one another? What about those that are queer? How does queer phobia um, engage with and interact and impact people's lives? What about their migration statuses? These are all things that should have been but were not considered. There are concrete things that the government could have and should have done and they chose not to. So as everybody said before, the disability strategy is really and truly not a strategy. Thank you, Moki. Thank you very much for that. It's incredibly powerful. You're getting a round of applause from everybody. And actually going last, I think you've, you've really summed up everything we were thinking. And um, thank you for bringing that additional lens of intersectionality to our thinking this evening. Incredibly powerful, thank you. Um, so we had just gone half past five and it's, uh, we're gonna move on to the Q&A section. So I will just open up the question and answer bit. And okay, so we do, we have some uh, questions that I will read out to you. So I'll read you the first one. And if you'd like to come in and respond, please kind of un your, un uh, unmute yourself and, um, jump in. So this is from Rahul, who says that increasingly I have realized that meaningful, meaningfully advocating for accessibility requires the ability to master the details, whether it be remedying accessibility barriers on a website or framing standards for accessible airports. Can you outline pathways for mastering these precise details for someone who is a, in brackets, generalist disability rights lawyer? 
so it's how 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 does someone pick up all the kind of intricate details really that we've we've individually spoken about would someone like to jump in on that one peter yeah can you hear me okay we can yes we can hear you. uh i i draw i'd start off by doing what i think we've kind of all of us done today uh value not privilege value experiential knowledge um and we heard the complexity that there can be around that in the last uh, wonderfully helpful contribution but it's about listening and valuing uh, experiences which you may or may not have uh, and 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 what's been wonderful about the disabled people's movement you know in, in its in, in its kind of breadth has been the way that uh, a key thing it's made possible we have made possible together is not just allowing it to be that what's been kind of book learned a uh, research funded uh, so-called professional expertise has been allowed to be seen as the only valuable source of understanding and knowledge. And I think the mistakes that have been made by accident, let alone the mistakes that continue to be made by policymakers deliberately, largely connect with the fact that they do not listen to what disabled people uh, have to say. I mean, that's absolutely the shared message of what everyone's had to say today. Uh, and it's what we know so often. But the truth of the matter is, that we have talked to each other. We've not just got our individual stories to tell. We have a collective wisdom uh, from that lived experience and experiential knowledge to be drawn upon. And if ever there was a time when that should have been drawn upon, it, it, it was during the, the beginnings of COVID. That failed to happen. All the talk was of it's an emergency, must get on with doing something. Uh, and all that day-to-day -day evidence and experience that disabled people had from experiencing the equivalent of lockdown in routine life um, through exclusion has, I think, not been as valued as it should have been to make things better. So that's the thing for me, that if you want to uh, avoid the mistakes, get the devil that's in the detail right, listen, access, include, value what the multiplicity of dis 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 disabled perspectives have to offer. Thank you, Peter. Would anyone else like to add anything else to that? No. So what I would just add to that is um, I think you've got a group of, you know, really knowledgeable individuals here today. You've got disabled people's organizations up and down our country. Engage with them, contact them. There, there's a wealth of knowledge, lived experience um, from very different perspectives. Um, and I would encourage you, Raul, to, to find out wherever you are in the country, find out who your local uh, disabled people led organization is and get in touch with them. Um, and uh, in the UK, we've also got kind of regional organizations like Inclusion London, who are here tonight. You've got my organization, Disability Rights UK, Inclusion Scotland, Disability Wales, and Disability Action Northern Ireland. And they will be able to put you in touch with um, local people and local organizations. Thank you for that question. The next one is um, how to distinguish between not being able to access technologies because it is simply inaccessible versus because you are not uh, sufficiently tech savvy <laughs> who'd like to come on that we've actually had an interesting um situation at even break recently we have two blind members of staff and one of the platforms that we use perhaps i shouldn't name it that we use for collaboration um has recently been upgraded and changed and now it can't be used with a screen reader <laughs> So it's yeah. been improved and made it less accessible um, than it was before. And I think, um, you know, some, some technology is instinctively accessible um, and some is incredibly, incredibly difficult to use with, for example, a screen reader. So, um, and of the two blind uh, members of staff that we have, one has been blind for some time, so has got used to using JAWS and other software. The other one is newly blind, so is coming to it fresh, you know, having to think about platforms that he's used previously having been able to see them but now having to access them in a different way so I think it's not so much about the not being tech savvy it's about how um, intuitive the technology is to someone who's using it or accessing it in a different way yeah thank you Jane and I, I what I would also add is we've, we've touched on um, how disabled people have kind of been at the brunt of the pandemic We've talked about um, how disabled people will live in poverty, 
talked about how disabled people don't have access to employment. There is, we know there's a digital divide um, that not all disabled people have access to the latest technology, don't have access to sufficient broadband. And there's this fast moving pace to move everything to be digital first, and particularly from government that everything just must be digital, you know, we, to, to engage with your GP now, your doctors, uh, they want you to be digital, digitally savvy and have the, the most latest version of the software, the hardware. Um, and it means that it's leaving many, many people out um, of that. And I think we just need to be mindful that not losing sight of that fact of that digital divide. So I would just kind of add that to um, what, what you said, Jane. Thank you. And, and I think as uh, Kay alluded to the fact of the high price of cycling equipment, I think I would say the same for digital assistive technology. Um, so something like JAWS is incredibly expensive. Um, and I know if you're fortunate and you're working, you, you have access to work that may support you. But if you're not working or you're self-employed, often that might not be a route that's very easily available to you. So um, thank you. So I'm gonna move on to the next question, which is, so it says differently stated how to feel less guilty, not guilty about the accessibility barriers you face by avoiding intern, inter, internalizing them? Um, if I could answer yes. this one. Um, I would say always reminding yourself and catching yourself whenever those thoughts crop up because they will crop up. Internalize ableism is a thing because we're surrounded by ableism all the time. It's mm. difficult to not have some of it seep in is the fact that you are not the problem. Like you are absolutely not the problem. Um, as previously mentioned with the last question is that, oh, is it an issue of me not being tech savvy? The mm. technology should meet you, meet everyone where they are at. That actually is indicative of um, something being good. And it's also kind of like speaking to the subject that we're talking about now, the twin crises of um, climate change and the pandemic. As um, a disabled uh, woman and also of um, African descent, with the issue of climate change, the places that are suffering the most, those um, places that are in um, Africa, they're in Asia, that are in Latin America, for example, they're not the ones that created the problem. It's not the um, native and indigenous uh, populations that aren't being sustainable. It's issues that are being caused outside of their actions that are impacting them the most. And within looking at COVID-19 and the pandemic, being disabled means you are more likely, you know, six in 10, you are more likely to be affected than those that are non-disabled. So anytime that these thoughts are cropping up, and don't blame yourself for these thoughts cropping up. Like I said, we're surrounded by ableism mm -hmm. as the fact that it's not your issue. You are being disabled by your environment, by the attitudinal barriers. This is not an issue that has started with you and it's not something that's being exacerbated by you. It is necessary for governments, those that have the privilege, the power, the access to do what is needful and to do what is right because Disabled people, it's mentioned by this um, American disabled activist, Dr. Alice Wong, that disabled people are oracles. And as Professor Peter Beresford mentioned earlier, like this experiential kind of like knowledge, this lived experience, disabled people have been having to figure out how to live in a non-disabled world, time immemorial. So we are absolutely the best people to actually get us into a new age in which things are better, more accessible for us all. But to ignore all of that is absolutely doing the world a disservice, but it's certainly not your fault, but you are certainly part of the solution. That's perfect, brilliant. Thank you very much for that answer. And I think absolutely you, you, you were talking about the social model of disability um, uh, in terms of how to look at the world. And actually I remember, when I learned about the social model of disability, it transformed how I thought about myself and about actually where, where the problem lay. Um, up until that point, everyone told me it was my problem. I was the one that needed fixing. Um, uh, Kay, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to come in on that because I think it's really important to recognize the emotional labor and the emotional burden that disabled people have to do and encounter every day. And I think 
you know, encountering barriers, we are made to feel like we are individually defective or at fault and it's wrong with us. And there is that internalised ableism. On the other hand, I mean, I think I'm definitely in the grumpy old woman stage of my life, but it's like, if you don't feel guilty, you feel angry. And, and, and it's recognising that leaving your house or sometimes in your house, if you don't have control over your own environment, you are going to constantly encounter these things that make life so much more emotionally challenging. And I think that goes back to some of the mental health burdens that disabled people face because there is, there is a huge sort of sense and, and certainly some of the research I've done, you know, people talking about actually sometimes choosing not to go out and cycle, even though that was what really they really wanted to do because of the hostility or the barriers or having to explain themselves to other people. So it's like living always in that tension of what am I going to encounter? What is the impact on me? And is what I want to do worth do you, all that emotional effort and burden that comes with it? So I think, yeah. And, and I think, again, that's something where it goes back to that that sort of level of resilience that we have just in order to do the things that other people take for granted. And and yeah, the need for recognition around that, I think, is really important. Thank you, Kay. Um, so I'm just reading. There's another question in the chat. Um, so. OK, so um, there's a question saying there is an outstanding variety and quality of skills and knowledge amongst the speakers on the panel and in the audience. How can we harness that and collaborate more? I like that question. Who would like to come in? How do we collaborate and harness? So I think what we've all said is that that our voices haven't been heard. We've all said that the government hasn't engaged. We've all said as a result, um, policy and strategies are poor and don't meet what they should be doing. How do we how do we bring our community together? Would like to have a go, Jane. Yeah, I think you're doing it to some extent, Cameron. The uh, disability employment charter um, that has been devised, which kind of challenges or gives an alternative to the disability strategy, so called that the government have put ahead. I mean, that was very much a collaborative. Um, exercise wasn't it where a number of people with lived experience and experience of um, employment got together and came up with a, a better alternative or what actually needs to happen and and maybe there's um space for more of that you know on on all the issues that that affect us whether it's transport whether it's housing whether it's health and social care whatever it might be i think maybe you know collaboration is the only way forward we're never going to change the world on our own but together we have a huge voice. So I think maybe following that model of collaborating yeah. to, you know, have a have a voice. Thank you, um, Jane. Peter. Well, I, I think I don't like the word and I know it's a complicated theory, but intersectionality as a sort of a headline is helpful. And I'm thinking of two projects that our user involvement lead in shaping our lives has been involved in, which are all about that. One was about checking out uh, how much disabled women who faced domestic violence were ex actually excluded from services for women facing domestic violence. And, and that was quite an issue. And another issue uh, um, relates to, to travelers, gypsies, um, those, th those varied communities and what it's like if you're a disabled person in such a community and the, the kind of the way that a whole set of one barriers then can be additionally affected by another barrier. Uh, as it as it actually is imposed upon people who have disabled children or acquired impairments or or have been born disabled and and I think that um, that that's one of the critical things about in our complex identities doing more and more talking to ourselves and to each other because it's already been said none of us is one thing you know we may be disabled people but we are other things as well almost invariably uh, and other people who may not be disabled may also have other oppressions i think the only way that we're going to deal with what i must be honest and do see as a, a, a deliberate um process of, of creating barriers and impoverishment in the kind of politics that we we, we have globally uh, is for us to kind of like connect in those different ways and and work to connect in ways that are more inclusive and more accessible and take account 
of different issues of access. You know, like somebody's mentioned issues around being an indigenous community. We know things are different in what people call the global south and so on and so on and so on. And it's and talking to each other. That's what I think. Trying to find ways, metaphorically even, of talking to each other. Because what I hate, I hate so much, is the way that our media, all kinds of media, are, are actually work to make us not want to understand each other, not want to talk to each other. And it's not an accident. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Philip, did you have your hand raised earlier? Yeah, Apologies, so I want sorry. to say that, um, you know, I, I would say that it's a very good question about what can we do to to advance of, of the interests that we, we all have in common would be is uh, to talk, find a local organization group, uh, could be even like a small regional educational outreach group. And I think a lot of those outreach groups also have a lot of other uh, similar groups that they have a connection to where you could uh, arrange for sort of a joint group where you could either have a, for a larger audience for a more educational, experience to get more of the your word out or to you know you're if it's just you trying to advocate for a policy unless you're you know uh, Barack Obama or whoever your name is like you're not going to have a lot of success I don't think so it, it would be also a way to increase uh, your your the, the the scope of what you're trying to say okay I have all these people that want to advocate for this policy so instead of just saying no it's just me or it's me and my friend so something where you uh, speaking for someone as a policy background to write on probably the most complex tech in the world where i have a very not not very tech savvy at all so that was you know what i felt most comfortable in. thank you philip thank you i've got one final question which is um for aimed at you sasha um i hope that's okay but other people can certainly chip in so what, what role do you think local government has in identifying the local impact of climate change? And are you aware of any good practice anywhere in the world where local governments are involving disabled people on this issue? Um, yeah, um, there are some, not uh, scientific work, but reports from government uh, on Pacific Island, because you know that they have been affected with the sea level rise and uh, some of them are already first refugees, climate change refugees. Uh, but they also talk a lot about intersectionality and, for example, how we have this hidden discrimination. So when you have um, the thing that I didn't have the time to mention in my talk, we, when we have a climate change impact, we have impact before the disaster, during the disaster, and after the disaster. And uh, during disaster, this is uh, refuge. Uh, this is the shelters that are usually not accessible, and after disaster, it's most for children education because they are placed in the non-accessible schools, and um, usually they don't have their documentation. If we, if you have a extreme climatic event, so they can't asset, asset, have access to the doctors or to health system. And um, yeah, uh, what we can do, uh, we need to connect with the um, uh, local communities, local um, disability communities, and basically um, uh, risk assessment needs to be prepared with them. We can't have a risk assessment without them because we need to understand what someone who has a sensory disability needs, someone who has a mobility impairment needs. So, uh, yeah, we need to really connect with not just with the research, which is also important, but I would say to make a proper risk assessment, we need to connect with the local uh, disability communities. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you very much for that. So that's the end of our questions. We're just coming up to the end of um, our session here. I'm just gonna finish up by saying thank you so much to all of the panel members. Thank you, Peter and Kay, Philip, uh, Jamoki, Sasha, Jane. And thank you so much for your time, your kind of um, what you said, your areas of expertise and your kind of words of wisdom was incredibly interesting and really powerful. And I guess I, I would just kind of finish off by saying that what's the, the, the stream that 
comes from all of you is that disabled people are just left out of the equation. We're not part of the conversation. We're not um, in positions of influence and power because of all the, uh, the barriers, the systemic barriers that we experience. And the risk is that because we're left out of these things, the, the, when other people end up doing, doing it without us, it, it, it's never fit for purpose. It's always wrong. It's never the right thing. And it's never more a, a kind of that, that slogan of nothing about us without us just keeps ringing in my mind, just listening to all of you about it. And so the National Disability Strategy, we can kind of see why it's not fit for purpose because we weren't involved in that. There was no meaningful engagement about it. Um, and we can also see that with the climate crisis, if disabled people are not involved, we're going to have a kind of disastrous outcomes at the end of it. And the message for me and to everybody else is that if you get it right for disabled people, if we work together and remove the barriers that affect our lives, it's a, it, it helps everybody and you just get a better outcome for everybody in our communities. Thank you so much, everyone.